Hey everybody and welcome to Learning from Smart People. I am your host Rob Oliver and I am I'm thrilled to death to be here today and I hope that you will learn from what we're doing today. My smart person today is Regina Peterbursky. She is an Amazon seller, she's a coach, she's a podcaster, and she joins us from literally the other side of the world in the fabulous land down under. And I, Regina, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me, Rob. I'm absolutely thrilled, and it's uh, very rare to be called a smart person. <laughs> well, so I'm honored to be named that today. I will wear it as a badge uh, all around the house today. I, and yes, I am in Melbourne, Australia, where it's still dark because it's early in the morning, and we are in the middle of winter. Well, I, I'm assuming, though, that winter in Melbourne is not as terrible as winter is here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we... We go. Uh, no, yeah, it's not not as bad. It's probably it's a little bit worse maybe than the winter in California, uh, but it's certainly not Pennsylvania winter. Excellent. So, uh, well, thank you a for joining us so early in the morning and b for um, taking time out of your winter and spending time <laughs> with us today. So let let me talk about. Let's start right here. Okay. Can you kind of give me your backstory as to where did you come from and how did you get involved in doing Amazon selling? Wow. Well, my, my story is is long. You know, I'm, I'm an oldie but a goodie. Um, I'm actually an ex-refugee. I come from a refugee family. My family uh, immigrated uh, when I was a, a child from the former USSR. Uh, we emigrated to New Zealand and then came to Australia. So I only say that as a way that my background is certainly not entrepreneurial. My my parents worked, you know, manual jobs uh, and, you know, never sort of invested anything. They literally worked paycheck to paycheck to paycheck, you know, sometimes right. two and three jobs each. So it's not that I had a background or a family in that. Um but I did see, you know, hard work and, and, and the fact that nothing came to you, you know, for no effort. Right. Uh, and, and I remember, you know, after a, a number of years where, you know, after working two and three jobs each, my, my parents were able to purchase a, a, a fairly nice house for us as a family. And, and people would come and say, oh, beautiful house. Haven't you been lucky? And my father would always go back and say, you know what, the harder I work, the luckier I seem right. to get. You know, and I've never, I've never forgotten that. Um, however, you know, once I, I finished school, I failed miserably at university because, you know, I have one of those personalities. I tend to uh, get excited and start stuff, but I'm not really that great with follow through. And I get, and so I started two different universities degrees, failed both of them, decided to get a job. Um, it was, uh, you know, keen to get out there and, and work and uh, very quickly decided, found out that I'm actually really bad at working for other people. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm really not great at being told what to do and following rules. So I didn't really have a choice, to be honest, but to become an entrepreneur of sorts. So in my early sort of 20s, I did all sorts of things. I went out and sold all sorts of things on commission, which is really sort of what you do when you're a, a young person and, and don't really know what entrepreneurial stuff is. So you just go, so I sold insurance, I sold cars, I sold personal development programs, you know, pretty much anything that caught my whim. Right. And I did really well. Um, then I got the travel bug and I went, uh, I spent 10 years actually traveling for a living. And I used to do what you guys in the States call a tour director. So I worked for a company out of London where I literally took people on holidays all okay. over the world. And that was, uh, you know, about the only job that I've ever kept <laughs> for a long period of time. Okay. And in some ways, that sounds like you're getting paid to go on vacation with other people is basically what happens. Well, that's what it sounds like. But in reality, it's not uh, because... People who are on vacation, um, you know, if, if you think of people who work in retail and you get all of the, like the, the public, you know, in retail who are, you know, complaining and, and carrying on and have things to worry about, well, 
you multiply that 10 times for people who are on vacation. So, so I was there, you know, not on vacation, but I was there to facilitate uh, other people's vacation. So I was the, the person that was making sure that the luggage got to the right rooms, that the, the people got on the right buses, that all of their answers, you know, their questions were answered, that we didn't miss boats, that, you know, making sure that the plane tickets were right, that people who wanted to sit, you know, next to their friends on the planes. Were, you know, so, so, you know, it sounds glamorous. And, and look, it was amazing and I loved it. Uh, but it's certainly not a paid vacation. <laughs> okay. Now that you put it in context, I mean, it sounds like um, you are the person who is helping everybody else and making sure that everything goes well for them. But you're also the person who is fielding all of the problems and all of the questions. And Correct. so, um, yeah, there, that doesn't sound like a vacation at all. <laughs> <laughs> So. Def, definitely not a vacation, but a fantastic way to, to see the world and, um, and hone my people skills. I think that's really what that 10 years did, um, was really hone my understanding of human nature and people, you know, because people, when they're traveling, they're under stress. And that's a, a great way to, to learn about how, you know, people's behavior. And that has held me in very good stead. So when I, um, when I completed my 10 years of travel, I came back to Australia and I got into retail. I, I bought a fashion retail business because, of course, I knew nothing about fashion or retail. So I thought that's the perfect thing for me to do. <laughs> well, you know, it's, that's so interesting. Well, let me ask, then, what drew you to that? Is it something that you were interested in, that you were passionate about? Is it something... Or was it an opportunity that presented itself and you said, this is too good to pass up? Or what made you say? Well, look, all of the above, okay. all of the above. You know, um, some gurus sort of say, you know, look at what you were doing when you were a teenager in terms of what was taking up your time when you were sort of in your early teens. And that will give you an idea of what your passions in life are. So when I was a, in my early teens, I was sewing clothes for myself because I didn't like to look like everybody else. Um, and so, so fashion and design were things that were always sort of in my background. And so I, when I returned, and because I, I travelled a lot to Europe, you know, I'd gotten used to European styles and fashions. And when I returned back to Melbourne, there was a, a boutique that I used to love shopping from because they used to import things. And I was sort of probably one of their best customers. And okay. the owner of the boutique decided that she wanted to sell. And she approached me and she said, hey, I want to retire. You know, would you like to buy my business? And look, with 2020 hindsight, if I knew anything about accounting or business, I never in a million years would have done it. But I didn't. Okay. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm going to buy myself a frock shop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so I did. Wonderful. It's so you have this retail business, you're working that. And then what happens that you end up moving over into um, okay. Amazon? So, 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 so what happens was I find myself at the age of uh, 41 pregnant with my first child as a solo parent, mm. and which was perfectly fine. And when she was little, it was lovely. She used to come into, so, so I had a baby at 42. Uh, and as uh, my baby grew, and she reached sort of the age of four, five, six. It got to the stage where being in a retail environment five, six days a week uh, was not working for us, for the two of us as a family. You know, she was going to school. She didn't like going to after school care. You know, school holidays, I still worked most of the time because it was either me work or pay staff. You oh. know, and, and, re and retail was, was already starting to get tough um, and fashion retail in particular. So I was starting to look for opportunities, uh, as, as you do, because I thought, you know, what I don't want if, if for my child is to have what I had was, you know, my parents did the best they possibly could. But when I was at school, they were still working, you know, a full time day job and for a number of years, night jobs as well. And I certainly did not want my child to, to have that experience. So I started looking at opportunities. And I came across a few and I tried some and some worked and some didn't. And, and then uh, I saw an opportunity to uh, uh, sell things on Amazon. And here in Australia, this is 2015, um, you know, Amazon 
did not have a, a, a presence here. Um, so I didn't really understand Amazon. I didn't understand Prime. I didn't understand FBA, which is fulfilled by Amazon. But when I saw this opportunity explained to me, it really made sense because um, the model was the private label model where you basically find a product that's selling, um, find a way to make it better or improve it, find a manufacturer um, in China or offshore somewhere where you can get it at a good price, brand it yourself, uh, ship it into Amazon, and Amazon takes care of logistics and, and customer shipping and traffic. And because of my experience in my fashion business, I had already dealt with Chinese suppliers. I already had my own fashion brand, actually, at that stage. I was already uh, private labeling of sorts because I would go to Europe, find things that I liked, take them to Hong Kong, find fabrics that I liked, and and re redesign it under my own brand. So the business model really made sense to me because of my experience. So it was just a matter of you know, going into a different product line. I, I got out of fashion and, okay. and started, you know, got into these sort of stationary and office products, so consumables. And I found a factory. I had no issues dealing with, with China because, A, I'd travelled to China many, many times in my years of travel. And also I had already done business uh, in China through my fashion business. So, so that was, you know, very simple for me. So for me, it was just learning the Amazon ecosystem. And so I was... You know, because I was able to take all of that, plus my marketing background uh, and sales background that I'd had years, you know, I was able to build up, build up a brand. And in my first sort of, it took me 14 months to do my first million dollars in sales. So I thought, mm. you know, this was absolutely amazing. And very quickly, you know, I started it as a side hustle. And within 12 months, I literally closed my fashion business, walked away. And for the last coming up to what? six years now I've been working from my dining room table you know my daughter is actually getting sick of the sight of me because I'm <laughs> always at home always with her and she's now at an age where she no longer wants to see me anymore because you know I mean, she's too cool for school <laughs> I understood I, I feel your pain with that so you you found you found a product and you worked to get it private labeled and you're getting it manufactured and um, like how complicated is that? It, it sounds very, it sounds very difficult. You had the connections, you had experience. Um, like, can the average person actually do that? Yeah, look, absolutely. I, look, I didn't have connections in that industry. No, I'd had experience, but but you know, I did a training course that 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 took me through you know step by step. And there are plenty of very reputable training courses around out there that will teach you to do it. There are some that are not. So if you if your listeners are listening and want to get into this business model, you know, reach out to somebody who's done it to get a recommendation of a reputable training course. Um, but it's, it sounds complicated. It's actually not because there are all sorts of um, sites that are available where you can go online to find manufacturers. You get your samples. You, um, you know, people are people all over the world. And dealing with the Chinese, um, you're just dealing with people. So, you know, there may be a slight language barrier, but if you're finding a factory, most factories now have an English-speaking sales rep. Okay. So, so you can have communication uh, it's quite easy. Um, you can ship things. You know, Amazon has their own sort of training um, seller university where they show you how they would like, you know, things that, you know, you've got to be careful of labeling, depending on what sort of products you have. You've got to make sure, you know, if you're doing things for children, you know, there needs to have particular labeling. But but all of that information is available and it's, it just takes a little bit of time. Uh, to, to to do it. And, and you know, for that particular business model, um, you know, it does require some juggling. You know, there's, there's moving parts because you, you're a marketing person, you're a sourcing person, you're a logistics person, you're a branding person, you're an advertising expert. You know, so th there's a lot of moving parts. So it's a business model that I recommend. And actually, it it's really suits women okay. uh, because women are really good at juggling. You know, we're good at multitasking. And so this business model, and I have a lot of friends who have done very, very well, um, who are women. And in fact, I'm going to plug myself here. I do have a podcast and a um, Facebook group called Women on Amazon, where I basically highlight 
mostly women, not exclusively, who have done well with this uh, and other uh, face, uh, Amazon business models. Okay. Uh, are there, you mentioned a couple of things. And, um, number one, you mentioned that there are websites out there where you can find the manufacturers. Good. Um, are you able to tell it, either tell us what sure. websites those are? Or sure. Like, look, you know, El- Alibab- look, Alibaba is probably the, the easiest one. Anybody, anybody can join. And if you're looking for a particular product, you can, uh, you know, do a search or you can put in what's called an RFQ, which is a, a request for a quote. And you say, look, this is what I'm looking for. And manufacturers will send you details. But that's just one small part of of the process but if you want to like start and get your feet wet it's a great place to start okay um very interesting and it's then not a secret alibaba is not a secret no. but then you know there's there's also trade shows um you know obviously the last sort of 12 18 months trade shows have have not happened but you know there's a massive big fair usually twice a year in canton uh, or, or now Guangzhou, uh, used to be called Canton, which is the, you know, the Canton Fair, which is like the, the biggest consumer fair in the world. Uh, well, hopefully it will be again soon. And, uh, you know, not just Amazon sellers, but all, you know, wholesalers, retailers, manufacturers head over to, to China generally twice a year to source products. So that's a, another great way. And actually they have an online portal. So, okay. um, so you can actually go to the Canton Fair online and, and look for suppliers there as well. Okay. And now, do you, how defined does your product need to be before you're able to, to go and get those, do that RFQ? Uh, what, what, um, I'm sorry, what, what, what do you mean? So uh, can it be an idea for a product or like how specific, you know? Um, okay. Gotcha. All right. So, so. If you've just got an idea, then you might just want to start browsing some of these sourcing websites to, okay. to, to, to get big because, you know, for example, on Alibaba, if you sort of put in garlic press as a search term, um, you'll see all sorts of di- different ideas, or, you know, different variations of garlic presses. Once you find one that you like the look of, then you can dig deeper. Okay. And, and asking for an RFQ. With an RFQ, you know, the broader you are, the more different things you're going to get back from the suppliers. You know, it depends on what you want back. You know, if you just say, quote me a garlic press, you're going to get, you know, a thousand and one different variations at all sorts of different prices. And it's hard to compare apples with apples when one person is comparing, you know, you know, full on stainless steel, you know, hinges i mean i don't, I don't know i just don't sell garlic prices i'm sure. just using an example no. you know with, with something that that's that's a, a pretty crappy product so right. so if you're going to be comparing prices you want to compare apples with apples so you want to have you know quite a tight um details as to okay please quote me on this exact product okay does that make and sense no it makes a lot of sense and I, I look at it from this perspective i i'm an author and i've you know when writing a book I'm self-published, so I need to get it printed. And when I send it to the printer, I need to tell them exactly how many pages I have. I need to tell them what the exactly. what the weight of the paper is. I need to tell them, you know, what how many color pages I yeah. have, and so on. So the more specific you can get in what you're exactly. looking for, the more accurate the and comparable the quotes are going to be. That's what I'm hearing you say, right? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, you can't compare apples with oranges. You need to be able to to give your suppliers, you know, the specifics so they can then quote you for specifics. So then you can get a, you know, a, a really good comparison. Okay. But I think, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned to you before, you know, private label, uh, which is what I do on Amazon, is not the only way to, to take advantage of Amazon's sort of wave of buyer traffic. And we're talking, you know, as we record this today, actually we're in the middle of Prime Day, you know, and Prime Day, which is, uh, uh, if your listeners don't know, is uh, Amazon's um, made-up shopping holiday that they do every year to encourage uh, people to join the Prime uh, program. Right. And as part of that, they hit us sellers and say, hey, we want you to give discounts to all of our customers to encourage them. So it's sort of like it's a big shopping bonanza. And uh, one of my best ever selling days on, on Amazon was a, a prime day a couple of years ago where I actually did, are you ready for this? Over $240,000 in sales in one day. 
Wow. Impressive. Uh, congratulations so, on that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, it, it just happened to be lightning in a bottle that particular day. So I'm okay. just going to preface that by saying that was a one day and it's not an ongoing. <laughs> uh, right. And- <laughs> you know, ha- however, in order to do that, um, you know, the, I had to have a lot of inventory in mm-hmm. stock. You know, it took a lot of planning. Um, and, you know, to, to sell $240,000, you need to have, you know, at least $100,000 in inventory available to, to sell, right? Right. And not everybody has that kind of money to start. So, so I like to talk about, you know, some of the other ways that people who've got more time than money uh, can take advantage of Amazon. What wonderful. All right, you said you segued into this. So talk to me for my listeners that are saying, I don't have $100,000 to do this. I, I, I do have some time and I'm willing to invest that. Um, talk to me about the listeners who can put in sweat equity as opposed to uh, capital. So so, so I actually talk about there's seven different ways that I've identified in the last 12 months to make money. And I'm just going to go through them quickly in the list. The first one, which is probably the easiest, is the Amazon Associates program. So Amazon will pay you a very small, and it's getting smaller, percentage if you send them customers. So if you've got a website or now a TikTok or, uh, you know, some kind of way where you can talk about products, you know, or if you have a special interest, for example, if you're a fisherman and you have a fishing blog and you want to talk about all the different fishing rods and fishing equipment and you link those equipment, those posts back to Amazon products and your uh, people buy, Amazon will pay you a very a small percentage. So okay. that's, uh, you know, Amazon Associates and influencers. As I said, now there's quite a lot of people that are making money as influencers on Instagram, on TikTok, where they find deals on Amazon and they highlight them in their um, tick, in their little videos and say, you know, go and go and buy this garlic press. I think it's really cool. And they get a, a percentage of everybody who does. So okay. that's, that's one. So if you're somebody who, you know, is doing that stuff anyway, you know, if you're, if you have a blog or you're already creating content, you just link up all of your content to the Amazon Associates program. So that's super simple. The next one is what you do, which is uh, books, KDP, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing. You don't actually need to print your own books. You can upload them onto Amazon and Amazon will print them for you, right? right? Um, if you want to do print on demand, like that, that's a print on demand, or you can just do Kindle where people just download the books. So, so that's, that's a great way to, to make money. Uh, another way is Amazon has a program called Handmade. So if you're making stuff that you may be selling on Etsy, so anything that you can yeah. sell on Etsy, you can now sell on Amazon as a handmade. So you don't need to have a production in China. You can actually sell your one-off things. Okay. Or two off things, or you made to order things on Amazon. Okay. So, so that's a handmade program. This is quite a new program. Obviously, Amazon sort of wants to get into the Etsy business. Sure. So they're encouraging sure. handmade uh, sellers. Uh, another one that I actually love is Amazon Merch or Print on Demand. So Amazon has an interface. And in fact, my daughter did this during COVID, where they, Amazon will print designs onto all sorts of stuff. So if you've got a bit of a creative bend and can make some, you know, slogans or designs, Amazon will print them on T-shirts and coffee mugs and water bottles and, you know, pop sockets and you get a percentage every time they sell them. So you can actually do that directly on Amazon or you can do it with a third-party provider who does a print-on-demand and there's, you know, a lot of them out there, in, in, in certainly in the US, in Australia, not so many, but in the US, there are at least a half a dozen that I know. And they actually have what's called an API. So they have a direct linked link to Amazon. So you can create your product on their platform, link it to your Amazon uh, seller account, load up the listing. And then when somebody buys that product on Amazon, the print on demand company will automatically create the product and ship it to the customer. So you never have to touch it, okay? Right. All you're doing is you're creating designs. Okay. And, um, you know, that's uh, it's a beautiful way to, to start. And I actually interviewed a lady from a podcast a little while ago who, um, 
you know, it took her about 18 months to build up because she's got, you know, thousands of designs now on, she does purely coffee mugs okay. and she doesn't even do a lot of design. She just puts little funny slogans on coffee mugs. And she now has, you know, a million dollar a year business of selling, you know, coffee mugs with funny slogans on them. Right. But it took her, you know, to, to, to create, you know, 5,000 designs. That's not an overnight to right. <laughs> thing. So, so that, that's a time. So, so you've got to, you know, be disciplined sure. and do that. But it's certainly possible to do that, you know. And, again, zero money investment to, to do that. Right. Um, so where are we? So that was four. Now we're up to number five, which is arbitrage. So arbitrage is where you buy at one place for less and sell at another place for more. Yeah, that's sort of like the, the basics of arbitrage. So how arbitrage works on Amazon is there's uh, what's called retail arbitrage where you can run around your local grocery stores or discount stores and find things that are already selling on Amazon uh, for a higher price. So you can buy them in bulk or at cheap price and sell them on Amazon at a higher price. Uh, okay. So that's uh, retail arbitrage. You can do that also online. Yes. No, I was going to say, it's, I'm assuming that's similar to what some people do on eBay where they, they find yes. something local and, and sell it. But you're Absolutely. saying you can do that, um, do that right through Amazon or right through Amazon as well. Amazon and you can buy things on eBay, sell them on Amazon and vice versa. There's a lot of people, for, for example, I don't have an eBay US account and yet my products, there's a lot of people selling them. And what they do is they arbitrage them from my Amazon listings. So they buy them from me on Amazon and sell them on eBay. So you could do it either way. <laughs> um, so there's retail arbitrage, there's online arbitrage, and there's something called, which is a new model that I've learned, which is called Replan, uh, which one of my friend runs, which is um, where you're basically finding staples that, 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 that sell on Amazon, that perhaps people who are in rural areas or are not near particular stores, that they can't find those things, uh, and they will buy them on Amazon because it's convenient, and they're happy to pay more. Okay. So... So you might, you know, find something that that's sort of selling really well that you can find in your local grocery store for two dollars, but people on Amazon will pay twelve dollars for it because it's convenient and they can get it the next day prime. So, so that's that's the arbitrage model. That model does require quite a bit more time, and it does, you know, you you need a couple of hundred dollars to start in order to buy your your, your first lot. But it sure. doesn't require a lot of money, but it is quite time intensive. Right. Um, and it's, um, you know, and your margins are not huge. But again, I know people who are doing a nice six figures uh, from doing that business model. Um, number six is, you know, one of the like the, the big business models is called wholesale. So this is where you're actually going to established brands or to distributors and buying from them wholesale. So you're, you're buying at their discounted price that they would sell to a retailer and then you sell that product on Amazon as one of their um, um, authorized resellers. So you're basically okay. a reseller. Um, so again, you need a, a little bit of money to start this because most uh, companies, uh, distributors have a minimum purchase buy. But, right. you know, you can start with $500, $1,000. You know, it doesn't require a lot. You don't have to spend any time branding because, you know, that's all done. Um, so your time here is really spent in finding products to sell so again this is time intensive in that you're approaching brands finding brands doing research and convincing them to sell to you um, or finding distributors so that's wholesale okay. and then number seven which is what i do which is the private label which is the whole box and dice as we say here in australia where you're basically doing everything and you're building your, your business and and look in reality you don't need a hundred thousand dollars but my recommendation is you really need between ten and twenty thousand dollars up your sleeve to start this okay. business, um, and you can then build it up organically. You know, I have uh, you know a lot of friends uh, who started with that kind of investment, who build it up organically, and a couple of years later were able to sell their business for millions of dollars. Okay. So there's at the moment there's a, a really big push there are um, private equity there's there's money in the market for buying private label amazon brands there are companies that all they do is they find people like me 
uh, who've set up a little brand and they say, hey, we like your little brand. We reckon we can do a little bit more with it, but we will pay you, you know, X amount of money to take it off your hands. Sure. And so, you know, I have a lot of uh, friends in this business who in the last 12, 18 months have actually exited their businesses and have done very nicely when they've started from nothing. And in three, four, five years, I think one of them took 18 months and she sold her brand for, for a million dollars. She started from nothing and within 18 months sold it. Wow. So, you know, so, so, so that is, uh, but as I was saying before, it's a little bit more complicated. Look, none of the, the things that I've um, talked about are easy. They're all simple, but okay. none, nothing is easy, you know? <laughs> right. Got it. Listen, um, Regine, you have, shared a ton of information and I really appreciate that. Um, if people are interested in um, connecting with you, whether it's your Facebook group or um, website, or where is it that they can easily connect with you? Sure. Look, the easiest way to find me is I live on Facebook. So, and also Facebook messages. So if people want to connect with me directly, they can reach out via Facebook messenger. My Facebook group is called women on Amazon. Um, uh, also, I do have like a little um, uh, PDF that uh, I've created, which is free, that if people want to download, I can give you the link for those seven different business models. So if people are interested in finding out a little bit more detail in those seven different business models, they're welcome to grab that for free. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm happy to give you the link, Rob, that you can yep. share with your uh, audience. I will happily put that link in the show notes and people can feel free to take that and and download your cheat sheet <laughs> on these seven different Amazon business models. Okay. Wonderful. Regina, you've been fantastic. It is time now for three questions to establish your humanity. Are, are you okay. ready for this? <laughs> oh, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I, what is something that will make you laugh every time? Oh, um, Things that my daughter does. Um, <laughs> yesterday, for, as an example, yesterday we were talking about how my mother, her grandmother, watches, you know, uh, soap operas, Bold and the Beautiful. Uh, and so we were actually play acting the, the different reactions and we were looking up how, how many times, you know, Brooke has been married in, in the years. So there's always some, some, when you've got children, there's always something that'll make you laugh, right? Absolutely. That's, they will always bring at least a smile to your face. Sometimes definitely, definite laughter. Uh, apart from the necessities, what is something that you can't go without for a day? Well, I don't know. Do you count coffee as a necessity? I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how do you take your coffee? Um, all day, every day. I now have uh, uh, mostly black to start with, um, just a, uh, or you call it an Americano. So just a, what we in Australia will call a long black. Um, and uh, I do allow myself one cappuccino a day because I'm sort of trying to get off the milk. But uh, but that is my, my, my treat is the one milky coffee. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, being as you're down in Australia, Besides the prototype or the stereotypical shrimp on the Barbie, what would you say is the best Australian dish or food that if I was coming to visit, you would say, this is what you've got to have. Be it, that's not the stereotype. Oh, wow. That is an impossible question to answer because Australia, we're a country of immigrants. So you're going to have the best Chinese, you're going to have the best Greek, you're going to have the best Turkish. And we have uh, now, you know, what we call the modern Australian cuisine, which is really a mishmash of all of those things. Okay. So, um, but, but we have, you know, lamb, probably Australian lamb, you know, as we, we have pastures, we've got greenery sort of, um, and also our beef is mostly uh, grass fed. So, Pretty much our natural produce. We have amazing cheese. We've got uh, you know some beautiful islands that are that have very pure water and green grass uh, that make amazing cheese. Okay. So um, so pretty much any of our local fresh produce, um, I would say, is uh, you know come come down and and eat the menu in <laughs> Australia. <laughs> that, all right. We and you, you know what we also do eat. Uh, both of our um, coat of arms symbols, uh, yeah, our Australian coat of arms has got a kangaroo and an emu. 
on them. And you can actually uh, find both of those uh, in some restaurant uh, menus, especially kangaroo. Oh, kangaroo. Well, there you go. So um, just as a side note on this, the kangaroo and the emu, they both have one trait in common. Do you know this? Uh, neither one of them can walk uh, backwards. Uh, so I did not know that. <laughs> yes. So Australia is a land of moving forward. There is no retreat. It's always move forward. So I oh, love that. I, I think I it's a great that. way to, to end our conversation today. Listen, Regina Peterbursky, thank you. thank you so much for being here. Uh, to all my listeners, I appreciate you being here as well. And I will remind you, as always, that when you stop learning, you stop living. Have a great day, everybody. 